Welcome to another episode of Critic Reading Writing. My name is Atu Kweisin, and I'm a professor of English at Stanford University. Today, I want to talk about Sophocles' Philoctetes and how it illustrates the process by which someone gains a conscience through bearing witness to the suffering of another. And now, the Greeks were very uh, fascinating for using extreme circumstances to raise questions of ethical and philosophical importance. And so we find in Oedipus, for example, that the extreme circumstance is that he had been predicted to kill his father and marry his mother. What Sophocles' Oedipus Rex teaches us, though, is the question of how such a person, that is Oedipus, responds to this terrible knowledge. But secondly, there is also a sense in which the people on stage, the chorus, react with similar pain and bewilderment to the facts that have been revealed to them. So that both Oedipus and the chorus are caught within the same crucible of anguish, which seeks to purge everyone on stage in the action of any assurance of certainty. But this purging is also what allows their actions to be fully human. In Philoctetes, we get another such example of extreme circumstance. The story is fairly simply told. The Greek army is heading toward Troy and they stop at a sacred precinct called Chrysi to make him sacrifices to the goddess. Philoctetes, one of the military generals, happens to step on a snake which bites him and he begins to scream wildly out of pain. Because of his screams, the army can no longer make the sacrifices to the goddess. So they bundle him up uh, onto a ship and go and deposit him on an uninhabited island called Lemnos. In other versions of the myth, uh, Lemnos is inhabited, but in um, Sophocles' version, the island has no inhabitants whatsoever. The play opens on the 10th year of Philoctetes' abandonment. Now, what we find at the opening of the play is that Odysseus has arrived on Lemnos with Neoptolemus. Neoptolemus is Achilles' son. And he's brought Neoptolemus so that Neoptolemus will help to trick Philoctetes of the bow and arrows that he has with him. The significance of the bow and arrows is that they were owned by Heracles. And Heracles gifted these magic bow and arrows to Philoctetes when Philoctetes helped light his funeral pyre to relieve Heracles of the great anguish he was suffering because he had put on a poisoned coat that was burning his skin. The Greeks have received uh, an oracle that says that they will not be able to capture Troy unless they have Heracles' bow and arrows and Philoctetes with, with them. But Odysseus knows that Philoctetes hates him and that uh, he cannot be seen anywhere close to Philoctetes, otherwise Philoctetes will, will, will shoot him. And so he's brought uh, Neoptolemus to try and retrieve the bow and arrows. And this is the central uh, aspect of the play. 
How does Neoptolemus, son of Achilles, young man, but also a soldier, decide between uh, his duty to the Greek army and his uh, pursuit of a stratagem against someone who he knows is uh, incredibly in pain. Now, uh, to all intents and purposes, Neoptolemus uh, commits himself to the stratagem. What he doesn't know, and which appears later in the play, is how difficult it will be for him to stick with the original stratagem when it is revealed to him how much anguish and pain Philoctetes is actually in. And so I'm going to read two sections of the play to unpick a number of uh, uh, issues. Now, the section I am reading uh, from is very early in the play, and it is before Philoctetes actually appears on stage. The conversation is between Neoptolemus and a chorus of uh, sailors who have actually come with him onto the island of Lemnos. And this is what we see. Neoptolemus. This is his home. You can see it. A rocky cave he sleeps in. Two entrances. Chorus. Poor fellow. Where can he have gone? Neoptolemus. He must be out looking for food. Dragging that foot. Furrowing the ground. He may be quite near. This is how they say he makes his living. A wretch hunting wretchedly for gain with his winged arrows. No one comes near to heal his sufferings. Chorus. I feel sorry for him. No one to care for him. No companion to watch over him. Miserable and alone always. Sick from his savage infection. Bewildered as every new need arises. How does he cope? How does the poor wretch cope? This is the work of the gods. How the generation of man suffer when mortal life exceeds the bounds of moderation. He came from a noble family, perhaps second to none in his birth. Now he has lost everything in his life and lives alone with wild deer and shaggy goods for company, pitiful in his hunger, in his pain, with no rest or release from his torments. He cries bitterly, but far off, only babbling echo responds. Now, there are several things to note about this um, first uh, uh, section. Uh, first is that um, the chorus expresses pity for Philoctetes, but Neoptolemus does not. At this stage, Neoptolemus expresses no pity for Philoctetes. But secondly, the chorus also tell us the grounds on which uh, Philoctetes ought to be pitied. He is bereft of any friends. He is much in pain. He has no one to care for him. And most importantly, when he screams in anguish, he has only babbling echo to return to him. Now, the idea of uh, speech is the first sign of society or social relations. So the fact that the chorus note that when he screams in his anguish, only babbling echo returns to him is a sign of his lack of social relations. So he screams and the echoes return to him. The question of language is actually going to be picked up uh, later in the play and is going to be an essential aspect of how 
Neoptolemus manages to uh, push forward his uh, stratagem. When Philoctetes first appears on stage shortly after the section that I have read, um, the first thing that uh, comes up when he meets uh, Neoptolemus and the sailors is that Philoctetes is attracted to the Greek language, which he obviously has not heard for years. And so the first thing he asks uh, uh, Neoptolemus is that Neoptolemus should speak because he wants to hear his language. And, and, and of course, uh, Neoptolemus is obviously going to speak to him. But the second thing that happens is that uh, Neoptolemus begins to regale Philoctetes of stories of the soldiers from the Trojan War, many of whom Philoctetes knew because they were his comrades in arms. And so uh, Neoptolemus begins to tell him of the several uh, great heroes who have died on the battlefield, including, of course, uh, his father, Achilles. And um, Philoctetes is, is very shocked and pained to hear that the good soldiers are dying, but bad people are still alive, such as Odysseus, for example, because it is Odysseus and Menelaus and Agamemnon who conspired to take him and come and uh, dump him on this uninhabited island. So he's full of anger and, and, and uh, the ill will toward them. Uh, as part of the strategy, Neoptolemus agrees with him and manufactures a story of his own, a grievance about uh, being uh, prevented from getting access to his father's uh, arms uh, after he dies. And so uh, we see in this early stage a certain uh, almost camaraderie between soldiers emerging. We also see uh, the idea of friendship uh, between Neoptolemus and Philoctetes emerging. But we also see the relationship between a father figure. Philoctetes is um, Achilles' uh, uh, generation, and so he's a father figure to Neoptolemus. He refers to him as son and friend alternatively several times. And so to all intents and purposes, the uh, uh, trickery, the stratagem is succeeding. Until this next stage, uh, which I'm going to read from. Now, several things take place before the section that I'm going to be reading from. Uh, first, of course, is the building of a certain uh, trust and friendship between uh, Philoctetes and Neoptolemus. But another thing has happened which is very important, and that is that Neoptolemus has asked to be given the bow and arrows of Heracles. And, uh, but he asks in reverence for them, and so there's a ritual uh, of uh, being given the bow and arrows and handing them back to Philoctetes. And uh, Philoctetes has asked repeatedly that um, uh, Neoptolemus carries him back home to his hometown in Greece, which Neoptolemus has agreed to do. All this is part of the strategy, as far as we can tell. And so things seem to be going quite well for him. And this is what we see. Neoptolemus. Come then, if you are willing. Why are you suddenly silent? What has made you freeze like this? Philoctetes. Ah! 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 Neoptolemus. What is it? Philoctetes, nothing serious. Come on, child. Neoptolemus, is your sickness causing you pain? Philoctetes, no, I'm all right. I think it's easing up now. Gods! Neoptolemus, why are you crying out to the gods like this? Neoptolemus, to ask them to be gentle to me and save me. 
Neoptolemus. What's wrong with you? Don't keep quiet about it like this. Tell me, you seem to be in some sort of trouble. Philoctetes, it's all over for me, child. I can't keep it hidden from you. It goes through me. Through me. Ah, misery. It's all over. I'm finished, child. I'm being eaten alive. Papa pie. Ah, papa pie. Papa, 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 papa. By the gods, child, if you have a sword to hand, strike at my foot. Cut it off quick as you can. Don't spare my life. Go on, boy. Neoptolemus, what is it that's suddenly making you scream and cry out like this? Philoctetes, do you know, child? Neoptolemus, what? Philoctetes, don't you know, boy? Neoptolemus, what do you want? I don't know, Philoctetes. How can you not know? Pa -pa 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 -pa! Neoptolemus, the burden of this sickness is terrible. Philoctetes, yes, terrible, unspeakable. Pity me. Neoptolemus, what shall I do? Philoctetes, don't take fright and betray me. This happens from time to time. The disease comes and goes. Moving on when it's taking its fill. Neoptolemus, poor, poor wretch. All these sufferings make you wretched indeed. Would you like me to hold you, comfort you? Philoctetes, no, don't! But take my bow, just as you asked to before. Take it until the present attack subsides. Keep it safe and guard it. Sleep takes hold of me whenever the pain lets up. Until then, there's no release. You must let me sleep in peace. And if during this time they come, then I charge you by the gods not to give it up to them, not willingly, not unwillingly, whatever they try. If you do, you will destroy both yourself and me. I am your suppliant. Neoptolemus, have no fear about my intentions. No one will hold this bow except you and me. Pass it to me and may fortune come with it. Philoctetes, here, take it boy. Show reverence to turn aside the jealousy of the gods. Don't let the same troubles visit you as did me and the one who had this bow before me. Neoptolemus, gods, Grant these prayers to us both. Grant us a fair and easy voyage to our destination, to wherever heaven judges right and our mission tends. Philoctetes, ah, ah, ah. I'm afraid, boy, your prayers may be in vain. The blood is flowing again, dark and thick from deep down. I expect worse. Papai, Phil, <coughs> Papai, pa Foot, how you torment me. It's coming. It's coming closer. Help me. Now you understand. Don't run away. Atatatai. Now, this is something of a shock to Neoptolemus, because uh, until this stage, he didn't know how much anguish the older man was subjected to due to the sore on his foot, which was pus filled and extremely painful. He knew, of course, that uh, Philoctetes had a really bad limp and that he had to drag his uh, injured foot as he walked. But he had no idea until this stage of how much pain and anguish was involved. But what then happens, as we see, is that Philoctetes is so racked by pain that he cannot even speak properly. So the first victim of the anguish is his language. He cannot speak uh, coherently. Remember what we said earlier about the babbling echo that returns to him. So the theme of language and its 
collapse uh, returns in this uh, passage. And so when he screams, ah, 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 pa, 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 uh, the critics have noted that uh, the papapai, papapai, atatai, atatatai represents a mixture between uh, meaning making sounds. So papa, 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 mixed with uh, gibberish. In other words, he seems to be saying something meaningful, but it makes no sense because in fact, his language has collapsed. The other thing that we see is that uh, he falls um, into a, a trance. He says beforehand to the young man that, that uh, he will fall asleep, but uh, he should not be disturbed. When, when he wakes up, the thing will have passed. But the final thing, which is really important, is that he hands over a Heracles' bow and arrows back to Neoptolemus. Recall that He's giving the bow and arrows to the younger man before, before this. But the, the uh, giving it to him and getting them back is a ritual of reverence. The second time, he's giving the bow and arrows back to uh, Neoptolemus. But in a sense, the bow and arrows that he's handing over now are not the same as the ones he handed over previously. And the reason that they are not the same is that they have now absorbed the charge of his anguish. Uh, also, he extracts an oath from Neoptolemus not to hand over the bow and arrows to anybody, no matter what. Now, this extraction of an oath, and he says in the, in the section I read that I am your suppliant. In, in the Greek tradition, suppliants were overseen by Zeus. So Zeus was the god of supplication. So to, um, to pledge something to a suppliant and not to fulfill it would invoke the curses of Zeus. So when Neoptolemus swears, he takes the oath that I will not hand over the bow and arrows to anyone. He's actually swearing before Zeus. In other words, the strategy on the surface seems to have succeeded, which is to say he has acquired the bow and arrows of uh, Heracles, but it is not successful because he has acquired them in the face of the anguish of the older man. Now, if we step back and now try to place uh, all that we have just seen in the context of the evolution of conscience. But what we see in the play is that uh, Neoptolemus starts off first not pitying uh, Philoctetes, unlike the chorus of sailors. He has no pity, he just wants to get the bow and arrows. But as he begins to encounter the pain of the older man, he begins to change in his uh, response to his own original stratagem. Uh, and so he has become, as it were, no longer at ease in the old dispensation of what is really uh, political pragmatism. Odysseus in the play represents a mode of cold political pragmatism and calculation. For him, Everything is justified that will help the Greek army win the Trojan War. For the young man, he has to be persuaded. It doesn't take Odysseus long to persuade him at the beginning. And so as he is interacting with Philoctetes, he has become wedded to the idea of a cold and calculating pragmatism. When he encounters uh, uh, Philoctetes and he sees the anguish, he begins to shift in his mind. In fact, at some point, he asks, what shall I do? The what shall I do is a question that would not have struck him before because the what shall I do really means that he is divided between the political pragmatism and uh, the what he ought to do ethically in relation to this man in pain. What we see then is that um, pain, 
or the bearing of witness to another's pain produces not just compassion, but also a mode of ethical reflex, self-reflexiveness. Because what Neoptolemus comes to learn is not just Philoctetes' vulnerability, but his own potential vulnerability in the face of the other man's suffering. The, the play ends well, <laughs> in a manner of speaking, because Heracles descends from the heavens and resolves the problem that has unfolded in the play in the sense that he instructs Philoctetes to go with um, Neoptolemus to Troy. Odysseus has appeared on stage and tried to persuade Neoptolemus to just take the bow and arrow and just let them leave uh, to Troy, but Neoptolemus refuses. And as soon as um, uh, Philoctetes sees uh, his old enemy, he's incensed and he suddenly sees that uh, he's been betrayed all along by the younger man whom he trusted. And no matter how they try to explain to him that this is for the greater good and that they are going to find him, uh, uh, the famous doctor, Esculapius, to cure him of his uh, sore foot. He is completely adamant. He's very, very pained and he refuses to go. This is until Heracles intervenes. So Heracles' intervention is also to purge the domain of human relations of their essential contradiction because left to left to the domain of humans there will be no resolution to the crisis philoctetes is right to uh, consider a friend a friend and an enemy an enemy although he'll not be a good soldier and so when he senses that um, uh, Neoptolemus had deceived him. He's adamant that the young man is no longer his friend, can never be his friend, so there's no way he can trust him to do for anything else. Now, I started out by saying how um, the Greeks were adept at uh, using um, extreme circumstances to illustrate highly complex ethical problems. We saw it in the Oedipus Rex in the previous episode, which I'm going to put up here. But the other thing that uh, we can glean from this play is the ways in which the uh, loneliness of uh, Philoctetes is a loneliness not just of uh, being in the wild alone by himself. That is obviously extraordinarily uh, painful but it is that he is bereft of all human support and social relations. As mentioned in my previous episode on Aristotle, which we posted here, the, uh, one of the more painful um, aspects of suffering is the separation of um, anyone from the comforts of philia which is both familial and uh, in terms of friendship. And we see in uh, the play Philoctetes that uh, Philoctetes is bereft of any kind of failure. And so his situation illustrates a mode of extreme suffering. But what we see then is that uh, Neoptolemus in encountering this extreme condition of uh, lack of failure and ab abandonment comes to understand the full degree of it only on being confronted with the older man's extreme pain. And so the extreme pain acts as the way, not just of um, Neoptolemus uh, gaining access to pity for the man, but also recognizing what is the value of philia, which of course he will himself understand being part of a Greek army, being part of a famous family, and, and so on. Finally, the play illustrates to a very um, good degree the question of conscience 
and how it evolves on the bearing of witness to the pain of another. Because another's pain places us within the circuit of contamination. I said this in relation to my episode on uh, Oedipus Rex. Because this circuit of contamination that is produced on our bearing witness to the injustice and suffering of another requires not merely contemplation, but ultimately action. Thank you very much. Please remember to subscribe and share and enter your comments in the section below. See you next week.